coming up on Volusia Magazine. We get preparation tips when it comes to fire safety. Go back to school for some healthy habits and learn about the pearls of our waterways, the oyster. Those stories and more next. Welcome to Volusia Magazine. I'm Brian Vandal. In Volusia County, oysters are a staple on the menu at many restaurants. But did you know that in addition to being pleasing to the palates of diners, oysters also serve an important role in our marine ecosystem? Kate Starks here to tell us more on these ecosystem engineers. <music> oysters may be small creatures, but they have a big job. In Volusia County, we can thank these little guys for helping to maintain a healthy marine ecosystem. Oysters are considered a keystone species in the state of Florida. So what that means is that there's a variety of species of plants and animals that rely on them for habitat, they rely on them for protection or for food. So much that if the oyster were to disappear, the ecosystem would collapse. So they're very important for our marine environment to make sure that our ecosystem is staying in check and they're providing all these elements for different species. In addition to providing habitat and protection for other species and filtering the water, oysters also play a part in reducing erosion along shorelines. Oysters are also an ecosystem engineer in Florida, meaning they have the ability to modify the surrounding area to be what they need it to be. So as oyster reefs start to grow, they start to accumulate sediment and they can start to spread. So they help to protect the shoreline by buffering any boat wakes that would be hitting grasses or anything up on the shoreline. Having the oyster beds in front of the shorelines is kind of the first wave of defense against erosion. This marsh was created in 2014 to help to restore the natural environment here, and oyster bags have been placed along the shoreline to help with the erosion. However, oyster populations in Florida are declining due to overharvesting, brown tide events, rising sea levels, and careless boaters. That's where organizations like the Marine Discovery Center came in, working with partners to create the Shuck and Share program. Shuck and Share was created in 2014 to provide a stable source of shell for our uh, shoreline restoration practitioners. So what we noticed as a group is that we had all these great shoreline restoration ideas, but no shell to be able to put back out onto the shoreline. So we went out for a grant and Marine Discovery Center was able to get a grant that started the Shuck and Share program. And since then it has grown. So how does Shuck and Share work? The Marine Discovery Center has partnered with restaurants in the county who've agreed to collect their oyster shells rather than throwing them away. Volunteers pick up these shells and bring them to the center where they're sorted and left to sit in the sun. This process allows the environment to destroy any pathogens or bacteria on the shells. Once cleared for use, the Marine Discovery Center works with volunteers to create either oyster bags or mats to be deployed into our waterways. Once in the water, the shells provide a place for baby oysters to settle and grow. These are oyster bags. They weigh about 30 pounds a piece and they're covered in a Naltex plastic, which is a marine grade mesh that's used for aquaculture. So it's safe to put in the water, doesn't leach chemicals, it doesn't break down over time. We put these guys on the shoreline and they help to accumulate sediment and hold on to sand that would otherwise erode into the water. And they're also um, act as a wave break. They buffer against any waves that may be coming up on the shoreline. And they provide habitat for oysters. So their purpose is really triple fold that they can do a lot to protect the shoreline in one small package. Oyster mats are used specifically for oyster reefs. Um, it's a single 16 by 16 grid with 36 oyster shells on it that are placed onto an eroded oyster reef that has been raked back down to elevation. When you put thousands of them out, they create a quilt um, that can help to bring back the oyster population. This theory was created by University of Central Florida and is used primarily in Canaveral National Seashore by the Sea Lab students and graduate students at University of Central Florida. So how successful has the Shuck and Share program been since the Marine Discovery Center began in 2014? 
In Volusia County, we recycle uh, oyster shells from 17 local restaurants, and in this year, we've recycled 100,000 pounds of shell. Total, we've recycled 600,000 pounds of shell, and most of that is already back out in the environment, creating new oyster reefs. By quarantining these shells for at least six months before we bag them up and deploy them, we're making sure that the shell is safe. Um, bugs are picking them clean, rain is washing everything away, the sun bakes them dry. So at the end of that six months, you have this pristine calcium carbonate shell that is safe to put back on our, on our ecosystems. If they weren't recycled with the Chuck and Share program, they would end up in a landfill. Um, so we're trying to make sure that we're keeping all that extra waste out of the landfill and repurposing it to create new oyster reefs. To learn more about the Shuck and Share program, including volunteer opportunities and participating restaurants, visit shuckandshare.org. For Volusia Magazine, I'm Kate Sark. Volusia.org is your online county government resource. View the county council agenda and meeting calendar, as well as review past meeting minutes and archive video and audio. Save time and bypass the lines by going online to register your car or boat, pay a bill, and much more. Plus, you can use the site to discover activities, workshops, and ways to become involved with your community. Volusia.org is your portal to everything Volusia County. The Volusia County Health Department has teamed up with the Early Learning Coalition to get our youngest residents on the road to good health. Dr. Holly Smith has more in Community Health Matters. We talked about at our last lesson how important fruits and vegetables are to all our organs. That's Jill Toffer. She's a nutritionist with the Volusia County Health Department, but on this day, she's a preschool teacher who's focused on giving these tots the experiences they need to make healthy choices today and for years to come. And remember, Hardy Heart loves when you eat fruits and vegetables because it's so healthy for you. The Volusia County Health Department has been partnering with the Early Learning Coalition of Flagler and Volusia Counties. They're working on the 5210 initiative in their local preschools. 5210 is an easy way to remember the healthy habits that decrease the risk of chronic disease. Here's what it stands for five fruits and vegetables per day. Uh, usually two fruits and three veggies is a nice balance. Two hours or less of recreational screen time, one hour of physical activity or being active every day, and then zero sugar sweetened beverages. And the reason a zero is so important is because Americans get most of their added sugar through what they drink. Here at Champions Academy in Daytona Beach, the health department steps into the classroom and provides direct education to children aged three to five years old. The lessons reinforce those four healthy habits. And don't think their young age holds these students back. They are quick to pick up on the messages. What is that? Corn. What color is that? Corn. They really do immediately can tell you that water is the healthy choice versus soda. Uh, so they know that as an early age. But the more you can reinforce that and with the teachers here mirroring that healthy um, lesson, that healthy behavior, they drink water instead of the soda or sugar sweetened beverages. So it's a process. 
The organ wise guys or the organ wise guys are a fun way for the students to learn about their bodies and what their organs like that keep them healthy. Here's another organ, the lungs. So everybody find where your lungs are and then give a deep breath in. <sighs> your lungs love it when you exercise and play and run. The health department also helps preschools to create a healthy environment by using positive messaging and by discouraging policies that use food as a reward. There's also a small garden to help the kids understand where fruits and vegetables come from. Many were surprised to learn that tomatoes come from a bush. They thought they came from the shelf. Not only do they get to watch them grow in this garden, they get to use them as learning tools and then taste them to see if it's something they might like. The Early Learning Coalition helps parents to find quality daycare they can afford. The families they assist are asset limited and income constrained. Income is a barrier to being healthy. It is important to start early when teaching kids about making healthy choices. That way, the habit gets reinforced. And while the health department talks specifically about the healthy habits, the preschools support those lessons by integrating them into other activities. One of the parts of the program is that we provide materials to be used in the classroom. So for instance, we have little counters that are apples and bananas and grapes. And so as children are you know, involved in their regular learning during the day, they're using these materials as a part of that and so getting to be more familiar with what fruits and vegetables are called and, and making them fun and engaging and that's what we want to do so that when it comes meal time and snack time, those are the things that children are looking for and, and that, they, that they want to eat those things. Oftentimes, you know, a family may live in a food desert where they don't have access to those kinds of foods and so raising awareness of what they are and that they're fun and delicious is really important. At the beginning of this partnership, the coalition decided to start with the five of the 5210. That's five fruits and vegetables. So next steps will be uh, the hour of physical, physical activity. And to support that here in the program, we're going to supply some physical activity kits to every classroom so that when that classroom goes outside to play, they have some special things that they can take out with them. Uh, I think some of the things included in the kit are a parachute, a ball, um, maybe some bean bags that they can use. So again, making that physical activity engaging and fun by giving them those materials that they can use. From there, the preschools will focus on zero sugary drinks by making water easily accessible. They plan to install water coolers and cups. The nice thing about 5210, it's easy to remember. They're realistic goals, but also they're for any age group. So it's not just for children. If you would like more information on the 5210 initiative, you can find that online. There are also tools to help you implement 5210 at home and also information to help you grow your own fruits and vegetables or even locate a farmer's market near you. For the Volusia County Health Department, I am Dr. Holly Smith. The Volusia County Council meets on the second floor of the Thomas C. Kelly Administration Center, located at 123 West Indiana Avenue in DeLand. Public participation begins at 9.30 a.m. and the meeting agenda starts at 10 a.m. A live video stream is available at volusia.org slash audio and agendas are posted at volusia.org slash agenda. Future meeting dates are available online at volusia.org. Hi, I'm Josh Wagner. And I'm Billy Wheeler. During the planning stages of the Tomstead Veteran Memorial Bridge, people voiced their desire to have a Veterans Memorial Plaza on the northwest side of the bridge. The Veterans Memorial Plaza will create a special place in our community for people to reflect and connect with our fallen heroes. The proposed concept for the new Veterans Memorial Plaza is estimated to be a $1.2 million endeavor. Your donation will help us create a special place in our community in which we can honor Volusia County veterans from all military branches and military conflicts. To help fund our Veterans Memorial Plaza, visit veteransmemorialbridge.com or call Volusia County Accounting at 386-736-5933. We appreciate your support to create this lasting memorial for those who have served and continue to serve our country.
There are nearly 360,000 fires each year in the United States. Knowing what to do in the case of a fire is essential and a matter of life and death. Kevin Captain visits the Volusia County Fire Rescue for some helpful advice. Volusia County Fire Rescue's major mission is to fight fires and protect life and property. But one of their other primary missions is fire prevention. To learn more, we visited Deputy Chief Noble Taylor. Chief Taylor, where are we at right now? Well, today, Kevin, we're at the Volusia County Fire Rescue Fire Service Institute, commonly referred to as a training center. Uh, there's thousands of hours of training that's done here annually for fire suppression, EMS, hazmat, wildland firefighting. And there's always a group that's up and coming through the college to try to get certified to go to work and serve the community as a fire. How often do you test your smoke detectors? Are you faithful about changing the batteries when you turn your clocks back? Or have you ever wondered how old your smoke detectors are? You can still buy the ones that take a nine volt battery that we change out uh, when we set the clocks back. You know, we spring forward and we fall back on the clocks. That's an excellent time to change the battery in that type of smoke detector. And I always take a Sharpie and write the date on there that I installed that battery. So if I forget, I can go back and say, no, I really did change that battery last month. Now for a few dollars more, you can buy a 10 year smoke detector that has a internally sealed battery in it that you can't take out and use it for anything else. And that battery is guaranteed for 10 years. And I, if you're in a long term home or you think you're gonna be there for a long time, I would encourage you to get those. Newer homes today have smoke detectors that are hardwired with a battery backup. But if you have an older home, you might be surprised to know that some of the smoke detectors available today have come a long way. Now there are even Bluetooth wireless smoke detectors that come in a package. You can put one in the garage, one in every bedroom, the living room. What's a really great feature about the wireless smoke detectors is if one goes off anywhere in the house, it turns them all on. They communicate with one another, no matter, so if you're in the garage, in the shower, wherever you are, one of you or all of you are gonna hear that device. Because it's an odorless, colorless, tasteless gas, Another good safety device to have is a carbon monoxide detector. When using small engines and generators, this deadly gas can kill. When you do run a generator, you need to have it 25 to 50 feet away from the residence or the dwelling that you're using it for, and you need to make sure it's in an upwind position where you don't want to be downwind. Have you ever come home from work hungry and you pop something on the stove for dinner, only later to find out that you've forgotten that pot on the stove? The National Fire Protection Association says that over 80% of kitchen fires start on the stovetop. And while you might think that all you need is a fire extinguisher, there are other protective products on the market today worthy of consideration. The stovetop fire stop is a type of kitchen fire protection device. There are many different kinds, maybe a different brand name, but they all primarily do the same thing. And they're about $60 a pair. They last for five years. I think that comes out to about 3.3 .3 cents a day, and they're magnetic, and they go up under your vent hood in your kitchen. This device is magnetic. You forget that it's there, but if fire makes this wick or high heat catches this membrane, it dumps a harmless to humans dry powder on the fire, and it puts it out. This is probably the most economical kitchen fire protection system. In the event there is a fire in your home, Making a plan for escape can mean the difference of life or death. We want to remind everyone that uh, even if you just did it six months ago, uh, all of us have children of different ages and some of us even as adults need to be reminded from time to time that this is our primary and secondary way to get out of our home and we're going to meet at our mailbox or we go, we're going to meet over here at our neighbor Bill's house on the front porch and that's how we establish our accountability. If you have a fire in the home, call 911 as soon as you can, even if you think it's small and you can handle it yourself. If you get out, when you get out of that fire, do not go back in. Emergency responders will be there in just a few minutes. And after you do your head count, if you're missing a child or a spouse, tell the firefighters when they get there. Volusia County Fire Rescue practices every day in the event that they need to respond to a fire. We encourage you to do that same practice by having an escape plan at home, 
making sure that you have a fire extinguisher, a carbon monoxide detector, and a smoke detector, because they all together save lives. For Volusia Magazine, I'm Kevin Captain. The Henry A. Deland House is a museum decorated completely in period style. The home was built in 1886. Henry Deland actually came to Deland, Florida in 1876 when it was known as Persimmon Hollow. His work here, his land acquisition, his contributions to the community in the form of education and churches uh, and land actually made him so popular with the locals they named the city after him. Henry Deland founded a education facility here in Deland that was called Deland Academy. His friend, John Stetson, had come down from New York and begun to acquire land, and Stetson became the major benefactor. It was eventually renamed Stetson University. When Henry Deland came here, there was nothing but tall pine trees, and eventually it evolved into a developed community largely because Henry Deland made it so. He was the one who believed that Deland, Florida could be the Athens of Florida. They said I couldn't dream. Called me a piece of trash and swore that's all I'd ever be. Said a bottle couldn't see the ocean. Give up. Go back to the dumpster. But I didn't listen. I made my way. And now, I am what I've always wanted to be. The saw palmetto is one of the most common plants in Florida, and the berries are used in many popular nutritional supplements. But before heading into the woods, you need to be aware of the strict rules in their harvest. Dennis Mudge has all the details in Solutions for Your Life. Hi, I'm Dennis Mudge with Solutions for Your Life, the Cooperative Extension Office, Agriculture Division. We're going to talk a little bit about rural land today in Volusia County. And what you might do in order to be able to pay those taxes on that land. You know, we don't often think about the fact that if you bought some acreage, and if you're not going to have a farm, how are you going to pay for that? Taxes are going to come up. You know what the real truth of it is? The land itself needs to be able to pay for the taxes. So that means diversifying in some interesting way. Now, one of the most common ways around here would be to harvest some timber. But what if that's not an option for 60 years? What do you do in the meantime? Well, you find ways to make money from that land. And one of those interesting ways is some new agricultural products coming out of the woods. Palmettos, the saw palmetto has a berry on it. It's become of great interest lately. And if you pick some ripe ones off, they're black, green before they're ripe, this is now being put in pills, put in pills for men to help them with their health. I'm not here to tell you whether that's a good idea or not, but I am going to tell you that this is one of the ways that we're making money these days. But the interesting part about this is it's regulated. The state of Florida, through FDEX, has set up rules, and you can't just go in people's land and pick palmetto berries. You have to have written permission from the landowner off the state website. You also have to have a license to go in and pick those berries. And even if you want to sell them, you can't transport them or sell them or anything without following the rules. Now there's a special website set up for this with FDAX, so you can check it out. But you can see palmetto berries has some promise because there's certainly some money involved if you have enough acreage. 
It used to be that a lot of folks would just go and walk in on people's land and pick these berries. That's not legal, that's trespassing, but it's even more so now because of the new agricultural rules, considering this an agricultural product. Palmetto berries in the woods, who would have thought this could be an agricultural product and a way to diversify your land? While you're looking about ways to keep the taxes down, well, this is a product that won't lower your taxes, but what it will do is raise some possible money to pay for the taxes that you have to pay. Now, does that mean you could allow some other picker to come into your land? Yes, but then you'll have to sign a permission slip for them with the state of Florida in order to have them come in. Agriculture these days is more complex than ever. It's scientific. It has a lot of research involved from the University of Florida that I'm a part of. But on a lower level, there are products like this now being found in your woods and out in your fields because the saw palmetto is so common in Volusia County. And this is one of those ways to research and check that out to see if you'd like to be a part of this. We at the Extension Office provide that kind of information. We had a class recently where some of the local entrepreneurs and farmers Ranchers and the Farm Bureau and the Extension Service were all applied together as we planned that event and had special speakers from the state. Big crowds show up for this kind of thing because it's new information, new roles. It's one of those things you need to know. If you'd like more information on how to do this, it's real simple. Take your smartphone or your computer and go to FDAX, F-D-A-C-S, and then put dash 08025 and that'll take you right to the site where you can print out this information you're gonna need. So if you're a farmer, a rancher, or you just own some rural lands, this is one of the many ways that you can be creative about raising money off that land to pay your taxes. A great thing to do, and a great answer to some of those issues as you diversify and be a real wise environmental steward over that land that you have responsibility for. With solutions for your life, I'm Dennis Mudge. The Atlantic hurricane season begins June 1st and continues through November 30th. Be prepared and take time to develop your emergency plans. Stock a 14-day supply of non-perishable food, water, and medical items for your family. Identify special needs for you and your loved ones. Discuss and create an evacuation plan. Remember, shelter should only be used as a last resort. For more information, visit volusia.org slash emergency. Stay connected with the latest Volusia County news events and updates on our social media channels. Like and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Catch up with previous stories on YouTube or just head over to our website, volusia.org. That wraps up this edition of Volusia Magazine. Thank you for spending part of your day with us. If you have any questions about the show, feel free to give us a call at any of the numbers you see listed here, or you can log on to volusia.org and click on the news tab at the top of the screen to find us. And we hope you won't forget to listen to Volusia Today. That's Volusia County Government's weekly public radio program. Volusia Today airs every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Sunday mornings on the local radio stations you see on your screen. For Volusia Magazine, I'm Brian Vandal. Have a wonderful evening.